On behalf of the uh, Jackson School of International Studies, Plowshares Fund, and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's discussion on a very important topic. Most of us in this room, I can tell, uh, we grew up uh, in the shadow of nuclear weapons, and it didn't really matter where you were. I grew up in Turkey, and little did I know at the time that Turkey, when I was growing up, was at the center of some of the most difficult discussions and negotiations um, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And of course, this state, because of its location, has a very special history, and it is a very important place for having these discussions about nuclear weapons. I was in the United Kingdom in London in the 1980s when I encountered some of the uh, most widespread and uh, big demonstrations against the plans to install Persian missiles in Europe in the 1980s. So this is something that has been with us for a very, very long time. And uh, we were hopeful that at the end of the Cold War, we would be moving into a different kind of direction. But it didn't happen that way. And in recent years, as we all know, with the developments in the uh, Iran nuclear deal and the tensions in Asia, the topic continues to be a life and death question for humanity. So I'm very pleased that we partner with some very important organizations, very active organizations, and we're able to bring to you a very distinguished panel of speakers who will talk about this issue from different perspectives, and hopefully we will have a lively discussion. Plowshares Fund is a global peace and security foundation. Its mission is to reduce and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons to stop their spread and to build peace in regions of conflict where nuclear weapons exist. Among other things, they bring together experts from around the world, as you will see today, who are able to talk about this issue based on their expertise and knowledge. Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility is the Washington chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility, which is the US affiliate of the international physicians for, for, for the prevention of nuclear war. They confront the most important health uh, issues, outcomes of nuclear weapons, climate change, and economic inequality, among other topics. They have a 40-year history of health-based advocacy. And they are also a partner organization for international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, which they were the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Jackson School is one of the oldest and largest schools of international affairs in the country. In a given year, we teach more than 500 undergraduate students and more than 200 master's and PhD students. Our faculty and students strive to advance the collective understanding of and engagement in world issues and search, for find, search to find meaningful solutions to global problems. The panel that we are co-sponsoring tonight is a follow-up, in a way, of a number of similar panels we had over the last month addressing some other uh, topical issues in our world, such as the caravan of refugees moving up from Central America and the uh, anti-Semitism within the context of Pittsburgh massacre, and next month we're looking forward to a discussion on globalization of this political consequences. So I'm very pleased that we are here tonight, and I thank you all for coming out. Uh, the event will start now with a specially videotaped message from Congressman Adam Smith, who, again, you all know, I'm sure, has served with distinction both in Washington State and Washington, D.C., representing uh, us. He was a state senator from 1991 to 1997. 
and he was first elected to House of Representatives in 1996. And his district, after 2010 census apparently, uh, was changed, and now it is the state's first district with a majority of residents who are racial and ethnic minorities. And that leads you to think about this concept of majority and minority and the changes that are happening in our world. As you all know, Adam Smith was just elected to his 12th term, and he is the incoming chair of the House Armed Services Community, the committee. He is one of the most knowledgeable experts on these issues, and I'm very pleased that he has agreed to take the special message uh, for this event. He was hoping to be here with us, uh, but he couldn't. But we are going to hear him, and then we will continue with the rest of the program. I want to thank the University of Washington for putting on this symposium to discuss the future of nuclear policy in our country. This is an incredibly important time. I think we have an opportunity to chart a new course, go in a different direction. And the number one overall goal here is to reduce the number of nuclear weapons and to prevent us stumbling into any sort of nuclear conflict. I believe that the nuclear posture review that was put out by the Obama administration and has been reiterated by the Trump administration is, well, frankly, wrong. Um, I think we're spending entirely too much money on nuclear weapons. We are stumbling into a dangerous arms race uh, with Russia on this issue, and I think we need to chart a different course. And we have the opportunity to do that. Now, the first thing that I want to be, do is let's be realistic. Um, the Democrats did take over the majority in the House. I'm in line to be chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. This is an incredibly important issue. But Donald Trump is still president, and the Republicans still controlled the Senate, and they have a different view on, most, on well, just about everything I'm about to say. So what I think is important is for us to stake out a clear policy alternative, hopefully get that through the House, and to move the debate in a direction that I think puts us on a safer course and also better protects our national security. And there's three main issues that we're talking about here. Number one, I think it's incredibly important that nuclear powers have an open dialogue. In this case, that would mean us, Russia, China, and North Korea. Back during the Cold War, uh, once we got into the 1970s with President Nixon and Carter and Reagan, there was an effort to make sure that the Soviet Union and the U.S., even though we were deeply in conflict, were in communication on this critical issue uh, to make sure that we didn't accidentally start a nuclear war. Um, and then Bill Perry actually has a truly frightening book that goes through all the times when we came this close, uh, when basically there was a misreading and one side thought the other side had launched missiles, but because there was open lines of communication, we didn't stumble into that war. We need to reopen those lines of communications, have discussions with Russia, with China, with North Korea. Actually, I'll say, you know, however he got there, the fact that President Trump is talking with Kim Jong-un, actually, I view as a positive thing because that's the number one biggest risk where nuclear weapons are concerned, is that one side is going to assume that the other is about to strike and launch their own preemptive strike. We have to avoid stumbling into a nuclear war by opening up dialogue, to have more communications with Russia, China, and North Korea to prevent that. That's number one. Number two, I think arms reduction treaties are incredibly important because that builds off a of number one. It's about communications and dialogue, whether it's the INF Treaty, New Start, or going all the way back to SALT one and SALT II uh, under Ronald Reagan. Having a discussion about how we can limit the number of nuclear weapons, I think, is enormously important. It helps with the dialogue piece, and it helps reduce that arms race, and helps make sure that there aren't as many nuclear weapons out there in the world, and I think that communication is important. But ultimately, the final thing I think we need to do is the biggest and the most difficult, and that is to fundamentally change the way the United States looks at our nuclear weapons policy. As it was developed post-World War II, and as we built more and more missiles, got to the point where I think at one point we had over 10,000 warheads. It was all premised on a philosophy of how can we win a nuclear war? Why did we need enough weapons to destroy the Earth seven times over? Because the presumption was, well, if the Soviet Union launches a preemptive strike and takes out, you know, I don't know, a third of our weapons, then we'll have these other two thirds and we can fight back. 
I think that is a fundamental flawed philosophy. There is no way to win a nuclear war. I think we need to shift to a philosophy that is focused on deterrence. How can we maintain a nuclear arsenal that is sufficient to deter any other country from ever using nuclear weapons? And I think we can do this a lot cheaper and with a lot fewer weapons than are currently being contemplated. And China's a pretty good model for this. You know, over here at the uh, Department of Defense and on the Armed Services Committee, we talk a lot about all of the weapons that China is building, and there is a lot of fear that is drum, um, drummed up trying to get us to, you know, keep up with China on this, that, or the other thing. Well, in the area of nuclear weapons, China has about 250. And this has long been their nuclear policy. They have enough weapons so that if anyone existentially threatens them, they have a very strong response. That is their policy. They don't have four or five thousand nuclear weapons. They're not looking to build a lot more. They have enough to protect themselves. That's the direction that I think we need to go in in the United States uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it reduces the possibility of stumbling into an arms race. And the more nuclear weapons you have, the more you contemplate the possibility of, quote, winning a nuclear war, end quote, the greater the risk. Second, it saves us an enormous amount of money. And right now, the Department of Defense, our country in general, um, has a, you know, more needs than we have money to fill. There's a $22 trillion debt. We have huge infrastructure needs in this country. Even within the Department of Defense, there are needs to fill readiness gaps and to deal with other challenges in modernizing our weapons. If we are spending $1.2 trillion on nuclear weapons, that's going to make it very, very difficult to have enough money to do any of the other things that we want to do as a country. I think this is a better, smarter strategy. Um, I want to thank Plowshares. I want to thank the University of Washington. You're pushing this dialogue forward. That's what we have to do. We have to get out of the Cold War mentality of, you know, the more the better. I don't believe that's true in the case of nuclear weapons. I think we can have a smarter nuclear weapons policy that's based on deterrence. I think we have to begin to make that argument and push it across this country in Congress uh, in every place we can so that hopefully eventually we will move in that direction. It is going to be an uphill fight given where President Trump is at and where the Senate is at, but I think we have the right argument and I think it's the best argument in terms of our national security interests and certainly in terms of the safety of the world. So I look forward to working with all of you as the new Congress comes in in January. Um, I think the, the state of Washington is going to be a great place to have this discussion. Uh, we have a lot of good members of Congress, a lot of members I know who are focused on this, and certainly if I do become the chair of the Armed Services Committee, I will be at least in, in a decent position to help shape this debate. I look forward to working with all of you. I appreciate the chance to say a few words. Apologize, can't be there in person. Actually, we're going to a uh, defense conference down at the, ironically, at the Ronald Reagan uh, Presidential Library to discuss this and many, many other defense policies uh, over the weekend. So um, I won't be in Seattle, but I wish you luck. Look forward to working with you. So I uh, would like to invite now uh, the moderator of this uh, evening's discussion is Dr. Amy Hegopian. Um, Amy is the director of the University of Washington's uh, MPH Master of Public Health degree program. And uh, she has been involved in uh, different kinds of research that focuses both international and domestic challenges in health. Um, problems that are based on uh, mortality associated with the Iraq War in 2003, migration uh, and its health, health consequences, um, especially migration between poor countries and rich ones, homelessness, and also incarceration. So some of the most important public policy issues and their health consequences, Amy is centrally involved. She's become a good friend of ours, uh, a good partner with the Jackson School, and we're always very pleased to work with her, and with her department. And I'm also pleased to let you know that in 2018, Amy received the Victor Seidel and Barry Levy Award for Peace. Thank you, Rashad. Can people hear me? I can't hear myself either. Okay, uh, this is awkward. Um, where's the guy who we're supposed to 
rely on it for the sound system. Just speak close to the microphone. But then I have to lean way over. Maybe you can help with this. OK. Uh, so thank you, Rashad. Um, I sort of feel like uh, an Armenian and a Turk walk into a bar, and they <laughs> put on a panel about nuclear weapons. So. Uh, I came to this issue when I was a kid growing up in Binghamton, New York. Um, uh, my nerdy 15-year-old self was president of our student body, and I noticed the building of the ICBM in Alaska and mobilized our student body in this remote high school that nobody cared about to take a stand on that issue. Uh, and I think that's kind of how many of us came to this in our own ways over time. So I moved to Seattle in the 1970s and noticed we were building a little submarine station out here uh, and got involved in the Live Without Trident movement. Uh, we mobilized a big downtown thousands and thousands of people demonstration um, in the 70s before the submarine arrived in 1982. Anybody? in that demonstration in downtown Seattle way back in the 70s. OK, a few of us. Good for you. All right. Um, so these days, nuclear weapons is not one of the political issues that rises to the top of our political agenda. We've got so many competing catastrophes uh, from the migration at the, and the violence at the border. Um, even the bombing of Yemen, which we just made a little bit of progress on, police violence, all sorts of things going on in our country that distract us from this really fundamental issue. Um, so nonetheless, we have filled this room. So thank you all for being here. Who are you people who come to this sort of thing? How many of you are students here? So a few, okay, did you get extra credit for this? Okay, no. Uh, how many of you are, would consider yourselves activists on this issue? Okay, quite a few. How many of you, is this your first time really thinking about this? Not very many. Okay, a few. All right, well, welcome. This is a very fun issue to work on. Um, so our goal here today is to ask some experts on nuclear policy to talk to us about this issue, which is clearly a global issue um, with the passage of last year's Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. It's also a national issue since we're about to spend a huge amount of our treasury modernizing our nuclear weapon system. You wouldn't want to have an unmodern <laughs> nuclear weapon system. And locally, where a lot of our leaders in this state are stepping up on this issue, and we're proud of that. Um, and we're also part of pushing them to do that. So um, I would like to welcome our panel to come to the table now. Uh, I think you all know which order to sit in. Some of us are still adorned with the fabulous jewelry that we were given at the reception from our friends from the Marshall Islands, and you'll hear more about that at the end. So um, first of all, I'm going to ask a question of Joe Serencioni, who is president of the Plowshares Fund. And he has written three cheerful books on nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, has worked this issue um, in Washington, D.C., the other Washington, for more than 35 years with a variety of organizations, um, the Center for American Progress, the Carnegie Endowment, and the Stimson Center, and the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also served as staff to two U.S. House committees, Armed Services and Government Operations. And he's been on the security advisory boards for a couple of recent secretaries of state, Kerry and Clinton. Uh, and as a security expert, he's often featured in the news, uh, MSNBC and uh, multiple print and digital news outlets. So we're going to start with Joe. And we're going to ask you, what brings you to our state? Um, you, your organization has been a very important um, contributor to WPSR, and we're grateful for that. Um, but in this particular moment um, in the nuclear weapons history, 
Why is Washington State important and why did you come here? Then thank you very much for, for those kind words and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, Washington State is in a unique position. There are a number of uh, political leaders, a number of movements that are sort of converging on your state to give you a, a unique opportunity to influence national and perhaps global <clears throat> nuclear policy. First of all, I, I'm, all of you know that Washington State houses uh, nuclear weapons, about 1,200 nuclear weapons. In fact, if, if Washington State was an independent nation, it would be the third largest nuclear power in the world. Uh, so you have an, uh, uh, a stake in this, you have a knowledge base on this, and now one of your political representatives is going to become, in, in almost certainly, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. You just heard Adam Smith. I have never heard a chairman of the House Armed Services Committee talk like that, and I, I, went, I served in the, in the staff in the 1980s. I could say there has never been a, a chairman of the House Armed Services Committee that was this knowledgeable on nuclear policy, this visionary on nuclear policy, this committed to making dramatic changes in nuclear policy. Even Les Aspen, when I was the chairman, you know, didn't really care about this issue. Ron Dellums, when he was chairman, cared, but didn't do much on this policy and didn't have the kind of knowledge, didn't have the standing to do this. So you've got uh, a chairman that, that if he just did what he outlined, would make a dramatic change to U.S. nuclear policy. But you heard him say it. He, he's, go ahead, you can applaud. This, this, but he comes in at a particular moment where a blue wave has just changed the face of the Congress, and not just from Democratic to Republican, but really moved the needle on progressive, on new. There are gonna be 100 new representatives <laughs> in, the, in the House uh, co come January. The Progressive Caucus, which has sort of functioned as a, a moral force, but you couldn't really call it a political force, is gonna mushroom to about 100 members. That's almost half of the Democratic caucus are gonna be members, and there are leaders uh, in, uh, of that caucus who are also from Washington State. So suddenly, you have a, a, a chairman of the Armed Services Committee that almost certainly will have a, a House backing him up, pushing him. Now, the last time something like this happened really was in the 1980s, which also was when the Democrats only had the House and the Republicans held the White House and the Senate. And you saw this explosion of reformist legis legislation <clears throat> coming out of the House. I was on staff. I helped craft some of this legislation on the floor of the House. You had members competing to put forward amendments to cut the MX missile, cut the B-2 bomber, you know, cut the budgets. I worked particularly on, uh, on the Star Wars program, and we cut a billion dollars out of that program every year because of the pressure from the House that then forces the compromise in, in the conferences. And even when that legislation doesn't prevail, and you heard Adam Smith talking about this, what you're doing is forging the policy that will become the policy of the Democratic Party in the presidential elections, and should the Democrats win the White House in two years, could become the new president's policy. An indicate, and this is what's so interesting about what's happening. So you have Adam Smith coming in, you have a whole new wave of Congress. This is happening at the same time that about two dozen presidential campaigns are starting their as engines. <laughs> and are all moving and are all starting to develop their policies. What are their nuclear policies? Now for many of the Democrats, what they really care about is domestic issues, and rightfully so, understandably so, but you all have to have a defense position. You have to say something on these issues, and you're starting to see the leading presidential candidates start to clear their, their throats on this. I have an hour to talk, is that what you said? <laughs> I'll, wrap it up. I'll wrap it up right here. This is, I'm gonna really, so, so, you have Elizabeth Warren, who just, uh, a few days ago, last week, gave her first major 
um, uh, foreign policy speech, uh, right centered in the middle of it is her nuclear policy, which not by coincidence exactly mirrors Adam Smith's. Cut the nuclear budget, preserve the arms control agenda, cut these first news use uh, uh, of, of nuclear weapons, stop President Trump from <clears throat> getting more easy to use nuclear weapons. It's ex and she's done this consciously to empower Adam Smith, to empower this kind of legislation in the House which, which can move. <clears throat> and wait, one of those presidential candidates could be your governor. <laughs> could be your oh, governor. Okay. You know, and so you are in a position to really help support those who have taken the position, reward them politically for taking those positions, and help shape this policy in a way I, I would say has never existed in the in the history of the state of Washington. All right. So that's why Joe is here. Okay. <laughs> Ben. <laughs> okay, now we're going to find out why Ben Rhodes is here. Uh, ben was President Obama's national or deputy national security advisor, and he wrote a lot of speeches for Barack Obama. He was a key advisor, uh, important person to Obama, led the secret negotiations with Cuba that led to the thawing of relations that had been cold since 1961. Uh, that was in 2015, the same year he was involved in crafting the Iran deal. So that was a busy year for you. Uh, I wonder if there were Cuban cigars involved in any of that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, this past June, his book came out, The World As It Is, a memoir of his time in the Obama White House. So um, you can catch him on MSNBC a couple times a week these days. And uh, my question for you is, it's been about a decade since you joined the Obama White House. And your boss then went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize a couple years later. Um, and the Nobel Committee noted it was attaching special importance to Obama's vision of and work for a world without nuclear weapons. And yet some things didn't quite work out there, and things have certainly changed since then. And I wonder if you would riff a bit on the threats and opportunities that we face now compared to the situation then, and how we might move forward. Uh, sure. Um Joe is excited everywhere he goes, but I've never seen him that excited. <laughs> I just want to say. Um, and actually, the annoying thing about negotiating with the Cubans uh, is that for the first 10 meetings, we would meet in uh, Canada, and they would always bring me giant shopping bags full of Cuban cigars <laughs> and Cuban rum, knowing full well that I couldn't take them back in the United States because it was legal. <laughs> uh, I think it was a negotiating tactic. So the Canadians got a lot of this. But we did change the regulations, so now there are unlimited uh, cigars and rum you can bring in the country. I did that for, for some selfish reasons. But um, So uh, reflecting on the 10 years, um, I think an important uh, point to make uh, that builds on what Joe said is it is, I, I cannot stress to you how important it is for the agenda of an incoming president to be fully formed and to get as much momentum as it possibly can at the outset uh, of an administration. Um, and and to just to take you back in time to 2007, 2008, when uh, then Senator Obama was running as kind of an anti-war candidate, um, we reached for the most ambitious ideas we could find um, on nuclear weapons and on the reduction of nuclear weapons. And that led to uh, the speech that I wrote with President Obama that he gave in Prague that outlined essentially an agenda to try to reduce uh, the numbers and roles for nuclear weapons uh, and to galvanize uh, a commitment to arms control uh, and nonproliferation around the world. Um, and what's interesting when I look back at that, the kind of the last decade, um, the areas where we had the biggest push out of the gate were the areas where we were able to make the most success. And so we prioritized at the outset of the administration uh, the New START Treaty with Russia. Um, and we completed that, and that led to significant reductions in the deployment of, of missiles uh, and warheads, um, a new verification regime, kind of the next generation of arms control uh, with Russia. Um, we also prioritized 
kind of the reinvigoration of the non-proliferation treaty uh, and making the non-proliferation treaty the centerpiece for how we deal with proliferation challenges, be that Iran or North Korea, countries that are outside of, of the NPT. And President Obama chaired a UN Security Council session on this in 2009, uh, passed a resolution uh, that reinforced uh, the NPT, and I'll, I'll come back to where that led. Um, nuclear security was uh, an area of particular focus, given the disturbing amount of vulnerable uh, and exposed nuclear material around the world. Uh, and we initiated a series of summits that were designed uh, to secure that vulnerable nuclear material. And, and you know, some of the most important things in government are things that you don't hear about because the problem is avoided. Um, but you know, among the nuclear material that was uh, secured was a significant amount of nuclear material that would have been exposed in Ukraine uh, that was shipped out of the country. And in the current conflict in Ukraine, it's probably a good thing there's not a lot of unsecured nuclear material around. Um, so w we made a lot of uh, forward progress, and then a lot of this moved into the Iran deal. And so basically, when Joe used to come pound on my door in the second term and say, why aren't you guys doing everything in the Prague agenda? I'd say, hey, we've got every single expert working on the Iran deal, and this is taking up all of our bandwidth and all of our political capital. Uh, and we had a very tough fight, and we are ultimately able to secure it. Um, and maybe that deal will actually survive the Trump administration. Thus far, Europe is keeping it uh, on some life support. Um, and so we were able, I think, to make incremental progress on reductions, on, on a new uh, treaty with Russia, uh, and then on a, a major a breakthrough in that the Iran deal is about more than just Iran. It's about demonstrating that you can have an arms control agreement that can work in the 21st century. There's not an inevitability to the spread of nuclear weapons, nor is there an inevitability to the US fighting a series of wars to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. And that's why that Iran debate was bigger than just that one deal. It was about the future, I think, of, of arms control and non-proliferation. Where we didn't make nearly as much progress as I would like is on a number of other issues where I would say a mixture of political uh, or bureaucratic inertia um, and in some quarters political cowardice uh, sets in, um, which really gets at what are we doing with our own house and how are we getting that in order. Um, I would have liked to have seen us adopt a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons. These are things that are intensely resisted by mm. the Pentagon, the State Department, the, the bureaucracy of the US government. And so uh, my lesson that I take away from that is, unless you come in with a full head of steam and do that at the beginning of the administration, it gets harder, not easier, as things go, go forward uh, to make those changes. Um, we hit a big uh, hurdle in our goal for further reductions beyond what the New START Treaty outlined when Vladimir Putin returned to the presidency in Russia and essentially said, I have no interest in talking to you guys about this. Um, I think we underestimated the extent to which Dmitry Medvedev was pushing beyond the comfort zone of Vladimir Putin. That's a whole other conversation. But essentially, that uh, put a roadblock in what would have been, I think, a second-term push to have conversations with Russia about further reductions that could bring in potentially China. I agree with everything Adam Smith said. You also, though, need people who are willing to talk to you about those things, uh, and we don't currently have that. I think, nonetheless, the US can do far more to reduce our numbers of nuclear weapons, and we don't necessarily have to wait uh, for a partner in order to do uh, uh, what I think would be responsible and what I think, importantly, Adam Smith uh, suggested uh, as it relates to working our way down to uh, a reasonable number. We identified at least another third uh, of cuts that could be made. I think, frankly, we could go beyond uh, a third in terms of our reductions. Uh, I think the biggest challenge and opportunity right now is this modernization budget that was alluded to. Uh, that essentially, if you look forward into the future, there is up to a trillion dollars set aside for the modernization of uh, the nuclear infrastructure. And that is everything from new delivery uh, vehicles, which uh, Plowshares has, has opposed, um, uh, to just stockpile management. Um, this is not necessary to, to meet the, the level of deterrence uh, that Adam Smith uh, talks about. Um, it is frankly wasteful. Uh, if I was, I, I generally don't put a lot of stock in, um, in consultants, um, <laughs> but if, if I was a consultant and I, I arrived and I evaluated what are the threats to the United States of America in the next 20 to 50 years, and what are we spending money on, I would spend a trillion dollars on climate change mitigation and the development of clean energy, not on nuclear weapons. Um, uh, 
that is obvious to me. And it is morally offensive and strategically stupid to not be doing that. Um, and, and so as we look at this, as we look at what Joe said, this influx of progressives to the House, uh, the, this new generation of Democrats, because I will tell you, to be blunt, um, sure, we did some things, uh, I think, not as, uh, uh, as completely as I would have liked at times, but we also did not exactly have right. support in Congress, including from Democrats, right. because we had basically a generation of people involved in armed services, and everyone named names, who kind of deferred to the military. And this is the reason why, just to, to, for those of you who don't follow this closely, it is so important to have Adam Smith there, is usually the chairman of the Armed Services Committee is kind of a rubber stamp, stamp for what the Pentagon wants. And so for him to be saying something that is so out of step with what the Pentagon wants is really important. Even if he's a very conservative looking guy, that's a pretty radical thing that he's doing for a chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Um, and I, I, I'd also say, you know, we had Democrats who were in this defensive crouch on national security issues that they've been in since the Reagan years, since the post 9-11 years. The Democrats have too many people whose view of national security is, how do I change the conversation? How do I change the subject? Or how do I change, how do I sound almost like a Republican, but not quite as unreasonable? Um, so that, you know, I'm for all the defense spending, um, maybe a little bit less. Um, no, I think we have a real opportunity here with this incoming crop to challenge the basic underlying premise of, does our defense budget make sense? Does the 800, 900 billion dollars we're spending on defense make sense relative to our other priorities? How, what, what do we apply to climate change if, that, if we're treating climate change as a national security issue? Um, so I think that there is a real opportunity in the context, as Joe said, of an incoming Congress and a presidential campaign getting underway to lift up pretty robust new ideas about how we're spending money and how we're signaling what our priorities are as a country uh, on these issues. Even if we have a Vladimir Putin and a Xi Jinping in Russia and China, uh, that doesn't mean we can't do more to do the right thing for our own security uh, as well as uh, what I think is the ethical and, and moral choice here. <clears throat> that depends on activism too though because I can tell you politicians respond above all to their constituents. Um, and, and what the Democrats did in this last cycle was so inspiring and watching it is that the candidates reflected the voters um, more than at any time that I can remember in my political life. And, and I think if we get more of that, uh, we'll get better outcomes on these issues. So that's why it's important to have civil society involved, it's, uh, students involved, uh, people like everybody in this room involved, because I can tell you that when people like me in 2009 walk into the White House, hopefully uh, in January 2021 to replace President Trump, we want them to have in their hands the most ambitious ideas, the best agenda, so that when we have hopefully a Democratic Senate, House, and President, this is how fast the pendulum can swing. But if we get there in January uh, of 2021, and we say, okay, we're here, what do we do? then we're gonna miss the opportunity. If we get there and we have a fully fleshed out agenda that we're driving from day one, we can make a lot more progress and continue that, uh, that journey that President Obama spoke about towards a world without nuclear weapons. <clears throat> All right, I would really underscore the role of you all in uh, moving our leaders in the right direction. Um, so uh, that gets us to um, some local activity to engage in that activity. So Bruce Amundsen is our next speaker and he is currently vice president of Washington PSR after serving as president for several years. Uh, he's a family physician who practiced in rural Colorado for a decade and then went on to lead a rural health project here at the University of Washington where he was my boss. Uh, so I've known Bruce since the 1980s. Uh, and then he went on to do some national consulting work for rural hospital systems, uh, founded the Spokane chapter of, w of um, PSR and has served on the national board of PSR. He co-chairs our nuclear weapons task force within WPSR, which helped organize a statewide nuclear weapons abolition coalition, um, about which Lily will tell you more in a little bit. But um, maybe we could just ask Bruce to tell us a little about WPSR's role for building popular support on this issue and helping to move our Congress in the right direction. So you can imagine what it was like being um, 
Amy's boss. Um, the question always was who worked for whom. Um, for, for those of us who have been involved in uh, trying to engage the public on this issue, uh, I can't tell you how gratifying it is to see Kane Hall full of people concerned about this issue. Mm -hmm. This hasn't happened uh, for a long time. Uh, when the uh, nuclear issue began to emerge again on the international horizon some years ago, uh, our leadership at WPSR looked around and said, what is going on in Washington in terms of nuclear activism? And what we found was sort of indicative of the whole country, that uh, uh, since, the, since the Cold War sort of collapsed and the country went to sleep about that issue, uh, there was act activity going on. Uh, our organization certainly continued to be involved. Uh, groups like uh, Ground Zero and Veterans for Peace and FOR involved in, in the issue for certain. But there was no coordinated effort among organizations. There was certainly no uh, statewide campaign to try to address this issue. So our board said, uh, we think we need to take the initiative to begin to cre recreate a grassroots movement in the state. And it made sense for several reasons. That at 800 members, we probably had the largest, uh, largest of the organizations that had been involved uh, in, in nuclear weapons advocacy. Uh, we had, uh, had a great support from our members, our physicians especially. Financially, we felt we had the deepest resources to help. Um, and we had members, uh, many of us had been involved in this issue for decades. So we had a, a, a great a history of both experience and knowledge on the issue. But in addition to that, um, PSR, ever since its inception, has seen uh, nuclear war as a public health issue a classic public health issue where either you prevent it or you're toast. There is no relevant response to a nuclear exchange. So the, our argument has basically been, uh, over the years, a humanitarian argument that uh, these weapons of mass destruction are such that they're indefensible from a humanitarian standpoint, and we would build on that argument as we tried to move forward in building, uh, rebuilding sort of an anti-nuclear presence. Um, we, we defined uh, a strategy that included two uh, major components. One was to begin to create, recreate a movement, uh, but to do that by, by enlisting organizations, not just individuals, because of course that had a great multiplier effect and immediately began to build a public movement. And secondly, to invite those organizations to come together, uh, not just to cooperate or collaborate on some issues, but actually to form a coalition. And a coalition is a stronger organizational body for action. Uh, a coalition implies that the organizations come together around some common purposes. So as we began to talk to organizations and rather quickly had 20 or 25 organizations that were very interested in, in coming together, um, we did a lot of groundwork to establish a common ground. We, uh, we established agreement on uh, what kind of initiatives and activities we were engaged in. But more importantly, we came to agreement on the policy, the nuclear weapons policies that we wanted to advocate for. And those policies included stopping all or most of the proposed rebuild of this monstrous triad, of trying to achieve a no first use policy in the state. Uh, Korea was emerging, uh, enlisting support of our members of Congress to uh, declare a no first use uh, uh, military action in, against North Korea. And so we had, a, we had a clear consensus about what we wanted to try to achieve. And we wanted to create the broadest civil society that we could. And over the, over the, the time, uh, we really were quite successful at engaging not only the traditional uh, peace organizations, but but, but faith-based groups, uh, environmental, labor, uh, social justice, and so forth. So the coalition has been quite broad, but more than, even more than that, we were clear that we needed organizations across the entire state in every one of the 10 congressional districts. And we've really uh, been, been uh, successful in moving in that direction. We have organizations that span Olympia to uh, um, um, the Canadian border and from the Olympic Peninsula to Spokane, currently involved in our coalition. The second, 
the second element of our, of our strategy was to focus this group on impacting policy. Uh, many of us have been frustrated for a long time with all sorts of activism and, and social activity and, and, and marches and so forth that are, on, on, that are not linked to trying to impact the policy. And we were absolutely clear that we wanted to, to mobilize these, these uh, organizations to try to impact and engage our members of Congress. And we have been very aggressive about doing that. We have met with every, we, we have always seen this issue as a nonpartisan issue. We have met with every member of our congressional delegation, the 12 members, um, uh, we've over 50 meetings with members of Congress over the last several years. And we are very clear in our meetings with each member that we try to titrate where they are with what we ask. Uh, our members of Congress span the spectrum from Cold War diehards, diehards to folks like Adam Smith who are way out in front in terms of trying to reduce nuclear risk. And in our, in our requests, we uh, tried to look at where each person was at and then a dialogue and the argument and try to, try to move them sort of uh, along the, uh, the policy chain. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, as these meetings were set up, much of the work done by people like Lily and the, re and the rest of our volunteers, as we put the delegations together, we were very clear that the members of the delegation ought to be comprised primarily of individuals from organizations in their district. So it was their constituents talking to them wherever we met around the state, and we've been quite successful at doing that. Um, Lily will talk a bit more about what we've seen happen. We're absolutely encouraged by what we see happening. Um, two final comments. One is that uh, we're quite aware in the work that we've done with other PSR chapters around the country and other organizations across the country that uh, we now, Washington now has the largest statewide anti-nuclear coalition in the U.S. Mm. Wow. Very clear. Um, and, we are regularly in contact with other organizations who are uh, definitely interested in doing this, who are trying to build off some of what we've learned, some of the strategies that we put together, which was basically a sort of political organizing 101. And finally, uh, after we'd been at this for a couple of years, uh, we were very fortunate to receive a grant from the Plowshares Fund two years ago to further support our work. And that helped us bring on a full-time staff person, who is my colleague to the left, Lily Adams, um, who brought uh, an awesome array of community organizing experience, and we really ramped up uh, the effectiveness both in building our coalition and our meeting with members of Congress. So I want to thank the folks from Plowshares that are here this afternoon for that vote of confidence. You're very welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, so next is Lily Adams, and I. My goal is to get us to audience Q and A by 6:05. So. We're closing in on our time. But uh, Lily is WPSR's security programs officer. Sounds so official. Um, and I would say she actually really hand built this coalition um, by doing the on the ground work of going and talking to lots of people. Uh, before coming to Washington, Lily was an organizer with lots of different groups CalPerg, Food and Water Watch, Students Against Fracking, and Corporate Accountability International. And she also also leads wonderful workshops to help activists get more articulate on these issues. Um, some of us have participated in those. So tell us a little about building the coalition and maybe give especially an emphasis on how to bring in young people to this movement. Sure, I would love to. Um, yeah, so in my role, I uh, essentially coordinate the coalition. Um, I started about two years ago, and that's when we kicked things off. Um, and I think it's just been amazing to see the growth in this coalition. I think when I started, I didn't think that we would see 40 groups all across the state um, now involved. And as Bruce said, that is, um, we think, the largest coalition of its kind in the United States. Um, so we have really seen our coalition become a model for this kind of work um, all across the state. 
Um, Bruce talked a little bit about the diversity. I think that was one of the um, best things we saw. We started with kind of traditional peace groups, the people that we knew had been involved in nuclear weapons advocacy in the past. Um, but I've been really excited to see entirely new organizations come in who we maybe wouldn't have expected, um, who are coming to realize that nuclear weapons issues also affect them and are a threat to their communities and through the kinds of money we're seeing being spent take away from their own priorities. Um, and so these are some of the reasons we've seen uh, groups who you know, work on social justice issues or environmental issues or educators come into the coalition as well. Um, and I think what's remarkable about this, gr remarkable about this group is that um, this is not just a list of names on a piece of paper, which is the kind of coalition I've worked on in the past as well. <laughs> um, this is a really active group. So we meet every single month. We have in-person meetings and people phone in. Uh, we have also, in addition to kind of um, these in-person meetings in Seattle, we have hubs all across the state um, where coalition members have come together to start their own independent work. Um, actually, in the crowd, I see a number of people from those hubs. I just want to thank you for coming all the way here. Um, but that is an example. They are actively involved. They're holding educational events in their own communities. They're passing local resolutions. Um, and very importantly, they are also meeting with their members of Congress in district um, to bring these messages straight to them. Um, so that's been really exciting. And we have seen that this kind of grassroots movement has translated directly into results with our members of Congress and the kinds of positions they're taking on policy. Um, and that is so important. So uh, you know, when we show up to meetings with these coalition members, as Bruce said, uh, we're showing them that their constituents and their voters really care about this. And that's really pushing them to go further. Um, so you know, we've seen members of Congress who told us a couple years ago, Nuclear weapons is just not an issue that I'm concerned about. It's not in my committee. It's not something I need to work on. Now they're stepping out and co-sponsoring legislation and signing on to dear colleague letters and, most importantly, voting the right way on budget bills on nuclear weapons issues. Um, and that's because of this work we're seeing. You know, we're pushing them to take those steps. Um, and I think we're seeing um, this uh, kind of trend in Washington state where it's not just a member of Congress here and a member of Congress there, but actually the majority of our whole delegation is moving in this direction with us. If you think about like a spectrum of support from opposition to allies, they're all kind of shifting in this direction to allies. So you know, we have 10 um, House representatives and two senators, so 12 total. Um, and this past year, eight of them made really strong public statements in line with WPSR's policy priorities. Um, wow. Thanks. And Amy, I'm glad you mentioned youth. Uh, that has been a really big priority for us at WPSR. Uh, I think it's been one of the big successes of our coalition is to bring more youth into this issue. Um, maybe, as you can imagine, this is personally very important to me because I would put myself in that category. Uh, I think for people like myself who did not live through the Cold War, who were in fact born after the Cold War ended, um, we never lived with that same kind of fear um, of a nuclear war, a nuclear catastrophe. And there's been nothing in our lifetimes to indicate that we have to see nuclear weapons as an urgent threat. It just doesn't seem real to us. Um, and I think we've thought a lot in the coalition, though, about how can we reach youth on this issue? Because it's not that youth just don't care. Youth care about a lot of things. Youth are really actively engaged right now on things like uh, women's rights and immigration um, and racial justice. Um, so how do we kind of break through that sea of issues to get them to also think about this? Um, so what we've done is try to find new angles for nuclear weapons issues. So um, something we did was we had a great event here at the University of Washington where we had a whole panel of speakers who were personally connected to the bombing in Hiroshima, uh, whether that was their family had died or they had visited Hiroshima. Um, but having those personal stories made the issue real for the young people in the room for maybe the first time. Um, Another event we did was we had an um, author and professor, Vincent Intandi, uh, who wrote a book called African Americans Against the Bomb. And his book really links racial justice and the civil rights movement to nuclear weapons and the peace movement in this really new and exciting way. Um, and by connecting nuclear weapons to racial justice, which is an issue that youth are really, you know, really care about and are working on, we had a lot more interest in this event. So we had a packed room of you know, 250 students, uh, which is rare for nuclear weapons issues. So for us, finding those new angles has what's been um, mm. really important to give students the opportunity to take action, because when they're confronted with the issues, they do care and they do want to work on them. 
Um, so that, I think, has been a really wonderful part of our coalition work is getting more of that youth perspective and finding out how we can move beyond, you know, like those traditional peace groups in our coalition, but also the traditional peace activists. Um, because we know we need lots more people to be involved in this issue for us to make the kind of policy changes that we need to see. Wow. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Joe and Ben uh, one more question, and then I would like to invite people to come to the microphones if you have a brief question or comment. Um, I stole this microphone, didn't I? So, okay, so line up there. That'll. Uh, then they have to cross over. Uh, we do have an extra microphone here. I don't suppose our guy wants to help us with. I didn't think so. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so Washington State, interesting place. One thing we haven't talked about is the cute little airplane company that turned into a major defense industry behemoth in our state and obviously still wields a lot of power. For example, the man who is interested in being president, who is currently governor, gave this company a $9 billion tax break a couple years ago uh, to try to keep them here, although it didn't come attached to any job guarantees, people may remember. Um, so that was kind of awkward. Uh, and still, though, we have been able to move our Congress people in this direction, despite the existence of this power. Um, so maybe you could speak to that. You know, it's sort of back to the fundamentals of the military-industrial complex and how s there are companies in this business who are getting very wealthy doing this. And so why should they move over? Yeah. Okay, let me start. So at 5.30 this morning, Eastern Time, the President of the United States tweeted out this. It's my job. <laughs> I am certain, I am certain that at some time in the future, President Xi, the president of China, President Xi and I, together with President Putin of Russia, will start talking about a meaningful halt to what has become a major and uncontrollable arms race. The U.S. spent $716 billion this year. Crazy. So here's the President of the United States <laughs> trashing his own defense budget. <laughs> so this is, an, um, there's a, so there are articles all over the defense news. I have a lot that I'm going to add to this, Joe. What, go ahead. What? No, 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 go, go, go. Go, ahead, go. So what does that mean? I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what Before that means. Before we give him too much credit here. No, no, no. I'm not saying this is his policy. I'm just saying when the President does something like that, it sends shutters through the defense industry because the president has also said that he wants all his departments to come in with 5% cuts. So here's where we're getting to Boeing. So the, all of a sudden you're looking at a $33 billion cut to the $716 billion defense budget. Well, where's that gonna come from? Where's it gonna cut? And when we were on the Armed Services Committee and we were also faced with, with those kind of cuts back in the 80s, you know, some of the conservative Republicans always talked about the missile defense program in particular as a honeypot. That that's where you could get the money to fund the things that you really cared about, your district programs. Well, the nuclear weapons program is like that. It's a lot of money, but compared to conventional military programs, it's not that much. You know, so you can, take the, you can take the money from there to fund the things you really care about. And history has shown that when you, when you ask the Joint Chiefs to choose, they don't choose nuclear weapons. They choose boats and planes and ships and tanks, the things that they really care about, the things that their troops really use. So there's plenty of money for Boeing to make uh, without... Uh, uh, W w without them fighting tooth and nail to preserve this particular sector. So what we have to do is mm -hmm. put together the, the, the arguments that you can cut here, 
safely. You can cut the nuclear weapons budget, and this is the place where you can cut and still keep America strong. And if you do that, you can push back the defense industry, uh, and you can get even a, co a company like Boeing on your side. Yeah, I, uh, the only thing I was going to add is, uh, I was just joking about, uh, I, I never put too much credence in tweets, even ones that, that I can find things to agree on. Um, but the, uh, but, but Joey's right. The one thing I would add is, um, you can stop right there. No, no, <laughs> is that uh, our nuclear weapons keep important. It's, it, it's um, it, the, because um, I, I agree, Boeing is a multifaceted, yeah. large enterprise of which nuclear weapons is not a, a particularly significant piece. There are issues around Yemen um, that I would raise with respect to defense contractors. You know, Raytheon in, in particular has, has put a lot of pressure on members to, um, to continue to provide uh, arms to Saudi Arabia for its war in Yemen. That, that was an, a hurdle that we actually overcame uh, in the recent resolution, but that's a different uh, cause. The one thing I'd say that's important to note here, though, is also the labs, right? So everybody focuses on the defense budget. Um, you know, a, a big piece of this is also members or senators uh, in Congress who have labs in their districts. Uh, a lot of this modernization money, some of it goes to weapons, some of it goes to, to the labs. Um, and, and, and here's the key. And this gets to the activism that we heard about. There will always be members who care about these things because there's some hardware in their district, right? Yeah. This is what Dwight Eisenhower warned us about in the military industrial complex. The reason why the budget is so inflated is in part because we had John Kyle um, uh, in a well-placed position from Arizona who wanted to fund both labs and, and uh, the defense industry and other members. You need other people to care as much about the issue as those members do. Uh, because essentially the only way in which what we don't like about the military industrial complex, the only way in which that works is if the members who really care about rewarding the defense contractor or the lab or whatever is in their district or state don't face opposition from people who care about the issue from the other side. So it takes activists making other members of Congress to care enough about these issues to push back on those members who are going to see it as part of their job to get money for these things, right? So, so that is where you come in. That is where this community organi organizing comes in. And I would add to the very good laydown of, of how to get people to care about nuclear weapons, uh, th this issue of the budget is fundamentally an important way to do it. Because all the things that you care about, if you care about climate change, if you care about education, if you care about health care, if you care about the solvency of Medicaid and Medicare, if we're spending a trillion dollars to modernize our nuclear weapons complex, well, that's a lot of money that we don't have for those other priorities, right? And so while I do think it, it can be the honeypot and it can be when pressed something that the chiefs will give up on, the projections and in, in the kind of inevitability, the snowball rolling down the hill of the modernization of all aspects of our, our, of our nuclear infrastructure and the development of new cruise yeah. missiles and new bombers and new delivery vehicles and new investments in the labs, once that money starts to get priced in and just becomes a reality of the 10-year and 20-year budgeting process, it gets harder and harder to stop that snowball from going down the mountain. And that's where it takes people uh, who care about these issues as much as the members who have a, an investment because it's in their district or state. Yeah. Right. Bruce wants to say well, just to add one thing, ma'am, I don't think we want to let Boeing off the hook too easily because uh, many of you may not know that they uh, just last year got a major contract to redo the ICBM leg of the triad. So they're in it right up to their hips. Uh -huh. And we, uh, that, that has not gotten great exposure around the state. That element of what they do is not done in the state. So it doesn't get the kind of exposure that their, uh, their, their plane production does. And we're trying to, trying to put the spotlight on that part of that industry. You know, this, just real quick. This, th this is actually going to be a, a big issue in the next couple of years because we've already sunk the money in to modernize the bomber. It's already spent. We've already sunk the money in, and it's very hard to stop the modernization of the sub. So in other words, we're buying a whole new generation of strategic bombers. We're buying a whole new generation of subs. But we haven't started buying the ICBM yet. So this becomes vulnerable. And Adam Smith is raising questions about the, wh whether the, the triad is really necessary, particularly whether you need that new ICBM. So it is the most vulnerable issue. So you're, thank you for pointing that out, Bruce. Boeing is going to be a player in that. They do want, that's, we're re looking at about $120 billion to build a new ICBM. How many people here are constituents of Adam Smith? Okay. 
worth noting. I think he has a staffer here. Is there a staffer here? Thank you for being here. <laughs> Let him know. Thank him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And that trillion dollars kind of has a ring to it. Isn't that the amount that our students are in debt for their loans? Yes. A similar number? Yes, it is. We have a person at the microphone. Hello, oh, I'm David Bergen. Does anyone know the uh, total spent on the Strategic Defense Initiative that wasn't feasible? This, uh, say it one more time, the, which part? This, do you, does anyone know the total that was spent on the strategic defense oh. initiative that yeah. wasn't feasible? Well, this is the longest running scam in the history of the Department of Defense. <laughs> this stuff, I mean, it just doesn't work. Right. It does, it, I mean, it, it just doesn't work, and we're now uh, up to about $12 billion a year we're spending on these programs, and the conservatives want to go back to the space race. So I think it's, it's hard to keep track of all it. I think we're up to about $320 billion that we've spent on, on these programs, and, and most of it has gone into projects that, that, that never worked, um, and that don't have any, any prospect of work. In other words, you cannot reliably intercept a long-range ballistic missile despite decades of, and, and about $320 billion trying to do that. Okay, over here. Yes, hi, Michael Rodding is my name, and I'm gonna do that. Uh, <laughs> My question is, assuming, uh, thinking hopefully that we do recapture the, uh, the presidency and this agenda moves forward, um, and also thinking realistically that uh, President Putin will stay in power, uh, do you think that President Xi and the Chinese could be potential partners for us, with us, uh, on this issue? Um. Well, you know, first of all, I think, uh, as I said, just to quickly tick it off, there are things that the United States can do on its own um, with respect to reductions in our own arsenal, with respect to significant reductions in, in the budget for modernization, with respect to declaratory policy, no first use, um, with, you know, a number of those things which Adamson mentioned. I think as it relates to an arms control agenda globally, um, I think there's going to have to be an effort to, you know, you need to multilateralize this discussion. Um, the basic problem is that everybody else uses, uh, if, if President Putin doesn't want to come into it, other countries use that as the excuse to not come into the conversation. So, for instance, some of the countries that are least uh, eager to discuss their nuclear arsenals are our closest allies in Europe um, because they like to have them, it comes with prestige, and so they, they want to avoid the conversation. Um, I do think, however, um, that the, a U.S. president could try to force this issue, and one way to do it is uh, to begin this conversation with the Chinese. Not because the Chinese, uh, you know, as Adam Smith alluded to, they don't have an enormous delta to lead to further reductions. However, our experience with President Xi was um, there are elements of his leadership style that are deeply troubling, um, but some of the very same attributes uh, can be harnessed for positive ends, and for us it was the Paris Agreement. So essentially we have this guy who's very ambitious, who wants to be a player on the world stage, who wants to, to feed the impression of a China whose moment has arrived, and we kind of used that, and President Obama cultivated that for about two years, let's do this big thing together, let's, let's jointly announce what the outlines of the Paris Agreement are gonna be, your commitment and my commitment together, and then that can be the framework that people come in behind. And that's what the Paris Agreement is. The, the basically the US and China had a bilateral agreement that was announced uh, at the end of 2014 that then created all of the, the framework and momentum for the Paris Agreement at the end of 2015. So yes, I, I think that just enlisting China in that discussion um, could be a way to catalyze some global conversation around the issues. I think uh, if you talk about the most dangerous, every talks about North Korea and the United States, the most dangerous flat point in the world is India and Pakistan. Um, and so you also need to find some way 
uh, that they will resist, but to have d uh, uh, more transparent discussions with the governments of India and Pakistan about their um, their nuclear arsenals as well. So I think the old model that we used in the first term to good effect with New START and then ran into a, a, a wall on in the second term is the U.S. and Russia leading, and then that allows you to, to, to move into a more multilateral discussion. I think there's going to have to be some creativity around this, and it's going to have to involve outreach to the Chinese. It's going to have to involve like pretty deliberate, dedicated efforts to make countries like India do things that they don't want to do, which is to have these types of discussions with us, um, and ultimately try to create some multilateral framework for this. And, and again, one other place to return to is the NPT um, uh, and, and, and verification. I mean, talk about funding, the IEA could be uh, much better funded as well. So, so yes, I think that's one place to start, and, and I'd, I'd look to other countries as well. Okay, NPT, you used an acronym. Oh, sorry, the Nuclear, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, okay. yeah. which is kind of the framework. The basic bargain being that countries with nuclear weapons are committed to give them up and, and at least be working in the direction of giving them up, so reducing their arsenals, and countries without nuclear weapons agree to not, uh, not develop them. A lot goes into that, obviously. Right. Okay, looks like we have some people at the microphone. We don't have a lot of time. Maybe we'll just hear each two people in a row, uh, just for the fun of it. Go ahead, so, tell us your name. Quick question, Craig, Craig Gannett. I just want to follow up on a startling comment that Mr. Serencioni made um, that I heard to be that if Washington was an independent country, it would be the third largest holder of nuclear, of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And my question is, other than the Trident base at Bangor, which I think we're all familiar with, where are those weapons? No, the, oh, that could be a quick answer, right? You, you know, the, that's it. They're, they're, they're all there, and it's basically the, the deployed weapons that are on the eight uh, strategic subs that, that come out of Kitsap, and then there's a storage facility to, for the uh, reserves. So it's a, it totals around uh, 1,200. If you give me a second, I'll give you the exact numbers. Okay, over here, tell us your name. Hi, this is Bill Donnelly uh, from Seattle. Um, the question is really about um, the possibility of a wag the dog moment. It seems to me that we have a relatively unsophisticated and unstable uh, uh, group of people in, in the current administration who have even talked about uh, the possibility of this. And I, uh, Joe and I talked about this a little bit, but Ben, maybe you could address this from your experience as to what are the possibilities of that being out of control. Yeah, I, uh, I can give a quick answer. I'm very worried about this, and I've been worried about it for some time. If you think about the arc of the Trump presidency, the first year he really did try to push a domestic agenda, and a lot of time was spent on health care and then the tax bill. Um, once that essentially was done, the, after the tax bill, that's when you saw him already moving in a direction where presidents naturally migrate when they can't get a domestic agenda through, which is national security. And that's when you got a trade war with China, uh, uh, that's when you got more aggressive immigration policy, including family separation at the border. That's when you pulled out of the Iran deal. So already in year two, that was when you saw this movement into immigration and national security policy, because that's where Trump is unconstrained, because the executive has a lot of power. Now he's got divided government. Now he's got scandals encroaching on him. And we've got two years, which is a long time. And so I've been quite worried about this. What I'm most worried about is Iran. Uh, if you look at the language that they're using to describe Iran, if you look at the number of flashpoints in that region, from southern Syria to Iraq to the Straits of Hormuz. We're not even getting to the nuclear yeah, program. The, the, the capacity for the United States and Iran to find themselves in a conflict quickly um, has always been there. And if Trump is in search of a conflict with Iran, it's not going to be hard for him to find one. So uh, uh, undervalued in the things that people are worried about today is the very real risk of a very real war between the United States, Saudi Arabia. Wag the dog here. It's not just here. You've got the crown prince in Saudi Arabia who's under significant pressure because of the Khashoggi thing. You've got prime minister of Israel who's potentially going to be under indictment. There's a lot of converging uh, interests among people who have uh, taken a very adversarial approach to Iran. That's one. And then, you know, uh, North Korea, it's good they're talking. That could that could unravel at any point, particularly because the North Koreans aren't doing anything. Um, Venezuela, uh, I look at as, as a wild card because there too you could see a domestic political interest colliding with uh, you know, a serious national security issue that could lead to some bad decision making. Um, so uh, it is something we should be worried about. Okay. I want to hear 
from you, and then you, and then we're probably out of time, so go ahead, say your name. I'm Howard Hu, I'm a recent uh, transplant from uh, the East Coast, and I have to say that having worked for IPP and W and PSR in the past, I am so impressed by how you have filled this room. It's really quite incredible. <laughs> uh, Helps to have great speakers. Uh, this is a general question about strategy. Um, I think that there's an opportunity here to link climate change and nuclear weapons as simply two existential crises from different poles. One's instantaneous, the other one is slow moving. Mm -hmm. and even the Pentagon has done all these study papers on what climate change means for social disruption, conflict, everything else. How does that play in the political circles and in the advocacy circles that you, uh, that you live in? I mean, is there an opportunity to link these together to link as these. an existential okay. problem that people have to understand is really both poles of a single problem? Thank you. Now let's hear from over here. Um, I will say Tillman Ruff was here a couple weeks ago um, from IPPNW, and he did that linking very nicely. So go ahead. Um, as a nuclear weapons and climate linker, my question really is about the press. Uh, Bruce had a wonderful op-ed this week in the Seattle Times uh, criticizing uh, pulling back from the Intermediate Weapons Treaty. When I was a student and got involved in the nuclear freeze movement, this was in the newspapers all the time. Why is the press no longer interested and what do we do to activate them? Okay, good question. Uh, okay, I'm gonna let you weave that into our final, those two things, into our final round, uh, which, yes. Why don't we start that way? Yes, with Lily. With Lily. Sure. Yes, I was going to. Good idea. <laughs> um, and uh, the question basically uh, involving those two points about the press and climate change is what can the audience do uh, to move this issue across the next two years as we enter the presidential campaigns uh, to keep this issue on our radars and uh, make progress? Lily. Okay. Um, well, as the coordinator of this coalition, you can probably guess that what I'm going to say is join our coalition. <laughs> um, but truly, this is a wonderful opportunity here in Washington State because we have this unique and dynamic group of people working on the issue. Um, and I think the great thing about it is that you can join whether you're looking for a big commitment or a small commitment. So you can come to our monthly meetings and help us plan events and set our strategy, um, or you can simply uh, show up to events. Uh, we also have a weekly digest email where I send out um, uh, once a week the news and resources and action items and upcoming events that you can be engaged with. Um, so there's a whole range of ways that you can join. Uh, and I think one of the wonderful things about the coalition uh, is that nuclear weapons, I think, can be a very isolating issue to work on. Um, it's very scary and complex, and sometimes it can feel like no one else cares, and sometimes it can feel like the world is about to end. Uh, so having this coalition has meant that we've formed this wonderful community uh, where people, I think, feel very supported and inspired by each other to know that you're part of this group of people who are really just working to make the world a better place and make it safer. Um, and it makes working on this issue um, actually a really wonderful and joyful experience. Um, so please join the coalition. Um, in terms of, I want to quickly... Is there information on that anywhere? Yes, I think we have an information table right outside the room that has uh, little half sheets about the coalition and our website uh, on there, so you can visit the website, and through the website you can learn more about what we do and how to get involved. Um, and then on the media point, uh, I think uh, the, everyone in this audience has a role to play here. Um, anyone can do what Bruce just did in submitting an op-ed or sometimes even a letter to the editor. Um, the opinion section of the newspaper is still, I think, the second most read part of the paper um, after the front page. Um, and I think what we've seen through the coalition, too, is um, a dialogue forming, especially in smaller local papers, 
um, where people are really reading these every day, um, you can be the ones to bring this up in your own community. And I think that is a really important way that we keep this going, um, both for um, engaging people um, in the public, but also engaging members of Congress. Um, staff of members of Congress scan the news for um, their bosses' names. Um, and you, we have found that this is a great strategy where you directly target a member of Congress in your op-ed or in your letter to the editor. Um, and I think that's a great way to keep the momentum going on this issue. So I would add this. Um, I, I would guess that all of you belong to organizations of some kind. It may be an environmental group. It may be a faith group. It may be a social justice group. Our argument is that every organization, no matter what their primary concerns are, has a common interest around the human, the, the human community surviving. Bring your organization to the coalition. The more diverse it is, uh, obviously the more powerful, and every organization there uh, can, can enlist this element of what we're doing, uh, regardless of what the primary purposes of your organization are. So if you don't get involved individually, uh, bring, your, bring your organization to a coalition, and let's have something that is so massive that it's unstoppable. <laughs> One other comment I'd make about the link between climate change and uh, nuclear weapons, you're probably aware of the study that was done that showed that even a modest exchange of nuclear weapons between Pakistan and North Korea would lead to uh, global cooling and a, and a famine catastrophe across the Northern Hemisphere, and the, the uh, instability of, of, uh, of nations the, mig the migration of populations is creating instability that actually increases the probability of war, uh, including nuclear war. So there are several linkages. Uh, our national organization sponsored the first conference on the relationship between climate change and nuclear weapons in Boston last year to look specifically at that linkage. Uh, we need more conferences of that kind. Um, so I, I just say, um, you know, first of all, um, you know, I, I've got two young daughters who are four and two, and the, the fact that, that our government is, is working actively against action on climate change is among all of the moral outrages that we consume every day. Um, at, at the top of the list. Um, it is hard to get your mind around the breadth of the irresponsibility that we are living through a moment in which we can prevent uh, potentially the scale of the human catastrophe and social disruption and economic catastrophe that we are currently sleepwalking into. And we have leadership that is actively denying the existence of the problem. It's almost hard to get your mind around the extent to which that is a complete and utter failure of our politics, of our society. Um, I think that the linkage is there uh, in many ways. Uh, I'd add this, you've heard me come back again and again to the budget one, because ultimately what politicians do is they make decisions about how to spend your money, and they're spending it on nuclear weapons instead of dealing with climate change. And if you think about it, to step back for one moment, if you think about activism, and this is why you matter and plowshares matter and uh, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility matters, you know, I've spent a lot of time the last couple of years, like you might think, wondering about how the hell we got here <laughs> after eight years of the Obama administration have Donald Trump. I travel a lot around the world. I travel in Europe where the Brits are dealing with Brexit, where the Germans are dealing with the return of neo-Nazi linked parties. I can tell you that the far right in the West is incredibly organized. They are incredibly financed. They're financed by the same people. The same people funded the Brexit campaign, who funded the Trump campaign, who funded all the far right movements that we see in the West. They are in cahoots with Russia. This is all happening before our eyes. They've managed to convince enough people that elites are to blame for their lot. And so you should trust these kind of identity politics, white supremacist based models of social organization. And that's allowed them to take political power. But the thing is, the pendulum can swing back. And it can swing back very hard. And the reality is, younger people are not with that program. 
Okay, it's not how young people voted in the Brexit referendum, it's not how young people voted in the 2016 election, and it's certainly not how young people voted in the 2018 election. I used to be one of them. <laughs> now I'm middle-aged. Um, but I can tell you that it's pretty simple. If young people in the West decide to elect leadership that reflects their priorities, we will spend that money on climate change instead of nuclear weapons. It's that straightforward. It's about registering and voting. It's about also saying that if people are mad at their elites, what you should be mad about is that you've got these leaders in Moscow, in Beijing, in Washington, who think it's a better idea to spend hundreds of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars on nuclear weapons instead of spending money on your social welfare, and instead of spending money on fighting climate change. It's, it's, if you're gonna harness a populist argument, we have a better argument to make than they do. So why are we losing? Because we're not as organized as they are. And so now is the time to get organized. And that happened in this last election cycle, but it has to happen through two, three, or four election cycles. This was the mistake that we made, right? Barack Obama got elected in 2008, and we thought everything was solved. But then we got clobbered in the next couple of election cycles when he wasn't on top of the ballot, and here we are. So the, the key to, to me is these organizations like this are, are the fulcrum. This is the hub for how you organize a movement that ultimately takes back political power in our country. And that's when we're going to have governments who reflect our actual priorities and not the priorities of people who are trying to fund a very different vision of how power should be allocated in the world. Nuclear weapons reflects that. There, there's no more morally offensive thing than a nuclear weapon. It, it reflects the idea of some people that they should have the power to destroy everybody else. And that's why there's a direct nexus between nuclear weapons and structural racism and peace movement because ultimately it's, 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 a, it's very existence is predicated on the notion that a very small number of people should make the decisions for everybody else. And I think that most people believe that the power should be the other way around. I don't want to distract from the passion and power of Ben's presentation. Note to self, never follow Ben Rhodes. <laughs> uh, so, so let me, I don't, I don't, I don't, I won't make a concluding argument because I want to make sure we have room to hear uh, f from, uh, from David to close this discussion. I tweeted out the facts on uh, the, how many nuclear weapons are out at Bangor. There's just, in brief, there were 12, 100 nuclear weapons here in Washington State, about half deployed on the subs, half in reserve. That's the equivalent of almost 14,000 Hiroshimas. So, you know, Washington State alone could deter any attack on, on this country. Um, I, I just want to echo what Ben said. The most encouraging part to me of what's happening now is, is the rise of the new mass movement. We have a mass movement growing in this country unlike anything we've seen since the 1980s anti-nuclear movement. And, it's, and that is what changed Congress. That is what's propelling people. And it didn't begin with political leaders. It, it began with the Women's March in January 21st, two years ago. And it has been rolling ever since. Um, and, it, it, and that's the thing that gives me hope, that makes me, makes me want to, you know, join with that movement, bring the issues that I care about deeply into that movement, understand the intersectionality of these issues and how they are all connected and how we have to support each other in order to achieve the kind of dramatic social change uh, we hope to see. Thank you very much for letting us spend some time with you this evening. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker, David Anitak. Um, something that I had hoped to talk about during the panel, which I might take a moment to talk about now, um, is that Washington State is very deeply connected to nuclear weapons, not just because of the 
1,200 nuclear weapons we have at the Kitsap Bangor Naval Base, um, but also because Washington State actually represents the entire life cycle of the production of nuclear weapons. Uh, so we have in eastern Washington uranium mining for nuclear weapons at a mine located uh, on the land of the Spokane Tribe of Indians. Uh, the next step is production, and um, probably many of you are familiar that we have um, Hanford in eastern Washington, which was the site where the U.S. produced the majority of their plutonium for nuclear weapons. Uh, the next step after production is to test the weapons themselves. Um, and the U.S. or um, Washington State has one of the largest populations in the country um, of Marshallese Islanders. And um, the Marshall Islands was where the U.S. tested 67 nuclear weapons, which David is going to talk more about. And then finally, after you do all of that, after you mine the weapons and produce them and test them, you have to clean up the massive amount of deadly waste that they produce. Um, and we also do that in Washington because at Hanford, uh, we have the most contaminated nuclear site in the Western Hemisphere and the largest envi environmental cleanup effort in the world um, to clean up that nuclear waste. Um, so Washington State represents this entire cycle, and I think what is very important to recognize and remember when we talk about this um, is that the communities that are harmed by this system are so often indigenous communities, communities of color, and low-income populations, our most vulnerable populations. And this is a trend we see not just in Washington State, but anywhere in the U.S. and anywhere in the world that nuclear weapons are produced and tested. So we often talk about, uh, you know, what are the costs of a nuclear war? How many people will die if we ever stumble into a nuclear catastrophe, as Adam Smith said? Um, but we cannot forget the communities who are currently bearing the burdens in their bodies and in their lands who are currently dying and in harm's way because of the nuclear weapons activities that we have already engaged in as a country. Um, so too often when we have events like this and discussions about nuclear policy, these communities um, are not brought up and their voices are not heard. Um, and so that is why tonight we felt it was very important to have a speaker here to share some of these stories. So David has dedicated his life to making sure the Marshallese community is not only heard, uh, but receives justice for the effects of those 67 nuclear tests on their home. Uh, David was raised in the Marshall Islands, where his extended family is originally from. And in 2010, David became a community organizer for Marshallese residents in Oregon, uh, where he helped co-found a social justice organization called the COFA Alliance National Network, or CAN. So COFA stands for the Compact of Free Association, which is a unique agreement that the United States has with three island nations, the Republic of Palau, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. So CAN, David's organization, was founded to achieve social and economic justice for COFA residents living in Washington and Oregon. Through CAN, David has helped lead successful efforts to pass seven different pieces of legislation in Oregon and Washington state to improve health care and access to care for COFA residents in those states. David and his family recently moved to Washington to continue his role as a community organizer for an activist for the Marshallese and now serves as a consultant to the Republic of the Marshall Islands National Nuclear Commission. I have personally been so humbled and inspired to work with David and others in the Marshallese community and to see firsthand their resilience and their compassion and their dedication. There was this relationship that we have built with the Marshallese community means so much to me and to WPSR. And I am so glad not only that David can be here tonight, but that we can continue to work together to find justice for the Marshallese people. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to David Anitak. Wow. Como <clears> Altara, <throat> or that's what we say. Thank you very much, Lily, for the uh, humbling and uh, amazing introduction. It's, it seemed like it was just yesterday when I was born and learning about all of this, and here I am. I'm uh, humble to be standing amongst you, especially uh, after hearing a powerful discussion from our panelists. It's, um, <clears throat> I don't even know where to begin. 
I put together a, a, a remark to kind of go off of from, but after hearing all of the wonderful and powerful remarks from our panelists and the folks that discussed and some of the questions that were raised, I thought I'll just go from the heart. And so first I'll begin by bringing Yaque or greetings from the islands. And Yaque is the word for love. And we use that to greet you or each other in the morning, at noon, afternoon, and especially at night. So yakwe to you all. And as said, my name is David Anatok. I brought with me um, my powerful partner and important better half, uh, Lucina Brocken, in the back there. Please wave your hand. Thank you. <laughs> Um, when I was invited to, to say a few words tonight, I, just like right now, I imagined lots of different things. Oh, I'm going to start here and go all the way there. And, um, and so there's a lot of joy and uh, at the same time, I, I bring um, the, the feelings from our people from the Marshall Islands. And I'm reminded of a lot of our elders that have passed and uh, the folks that are continuing to thrive, uh, thriving to survive um, from the nuclear era that took place in the Marshall Islands. As Lily mentioned, and as um, most of you may already know, 67 nuclear bombs in the Marshall Islands from 1946 to 1958 and all of them together is equivalent to 1.6 Hiroshima bomb each day for 12 years. Yeah, it's uh, unimaginable. It's hard to think about. Um, in the Marshall Islands, there are 33 atolls that are inhabited with um, the population, and and. And the testing took place uh, northeast and of the Marshall Islands on two main atolls, some of our powerful, I mean, most beautiful atolls, and um, Enuetak Atoll and the Bikini Atoll. Um, 43 of them on Enuetak and about 24 of them on Bikini. Bikini, uh, they did the largest hydrogen bomb, which is known as Bravo. And that's uh, 10,000 times Hiroshima. Um, during these time when they did the testings, they had to relocate and move people around and shovel people around. Um, a lot of the people and the, the community didn't fully understand what was happening. They, of course, didn't know English that well. When the general convened a meeting on Bikini Atoll to inform the chief and his people that he was going to, that the United States wanted to borrow their island to do testing, he said, this is for the good of mankind. So therefore, the chief, being um, a godly man himself and a faithful person himself, thought, well, if this word mankind means might be something to do with God, I'll give you the permission to go ahead. And they thought borrow the islands would be for a few months or maybe a few days, and then they'll come back. The people of Bikini today are still stranded and are, <clears throat> excuse me, they're, they're without their homeland. And so... Many of these uh, consequences that we face till today, as it was said earlier, we're now here in Washington, continue to thrive and try to find ways to uh, better our lives since the nuclear has come and uh, has a big impact on our islands and changed the whole livelihood that we knew from our ancestors and the traditional knowledge that we knew and the way of life that we knew has changed. And so has um, many of our activists from many of whom that should have been up here to tell you these remarks more um, in a better way so you can un fully understand and 
know what, what, why what you're doing and why you're here tonight is important. What PSR and all the organizers are doing here is important to reduce and potentially stop nuclear weapon is important because we've been through it. And we don't want any of you or any of our children to go through the same. I was um, incredibly moved to hear the importance of trying to link the climate change to this issue of nuclear. Because as you know, we now face climate change up front. Our islands are eroding, sea level is rising, sea acidification is as high as it could be, as it has ever been, and we're losing our, our lands and our fish, and again, it's impacting the very livelihood of our people in the Pacific Islands. And I'm glad that we have a space in this, this afternoon to say a little bit, because uh, not only the Marshall Islands, but in their entire, the entire Pacific Islands. And if you really think about it, isn't it the reason why the United States decided to came to the Marshall Islands and test these bombing? Um, because it's, it's tiny, but yet important. Military strategically wise, you know, a lot of the countries fought in the Cold War to see who was the most powerful by using these nuclear. Now they're being, they're talking about funding themselves even more so they can be more greater and more powerful. And, and our, our tiny islands and the people from these uh, Micronesia are not even considered at this discussion. It's always the big, big and the most powerful. Um, but yet, we're very, again, humbled and grateful that we're, we're here today. We're in the United States, the land of opportunity. And we can find ways to better our lives for our future children and think about what we could do to better care for our islands. And it would be something maybe perhaps if there was something I can leave for you today is that. Because if we do care, take care, my belief is that if we take care of the islands now, we can really take care of Washington. Think about it. From the nuclear era, the, from the testings of the nuclears in the Marshall Islands, we were able to, well, the United States, build a dome in the Marshall Islands. Now we have a dome. But instead of like the beautiful domes you have around the United States, you know, your football domes, or it's a nuclear waste dome. And it's on Inuitak, where my wife is from. The dome is uh, <clears throat> now right there at the sea level because of the climate change. It is cracked, and you've probably seen some documents on it. There's a lot of press outlets that have been out there, um, CNN and a few others. There's um, activists from our own, actually uh, one of our powerful poet, her name is Kathy Jidengel Kitchener. She is the president of our uh, first female president in the Pacific Islands, who is the president of the Marshall Islands, uh, Dr. Hilda Heine. She is an activist for climate change and has written many poems about uh, climate change. One of the most recent one is about the dome. How this dome is kind of, well in the islands they call it the doom. Um, and, and to have a doom is, is a precious thing in our culture. But with climate change, many of our islands can no longer have um, burial services or where you can lay your loved ones on the island because the threat of climate change. So some of the islands are, are questioning themselves, you know, where are we going to take our loved ones? Many of them are now buried here in, in the States. Um, so there's, again, as I said, I was excited for this opportunity. I was given 10 minutes. If I was given an hour, I would have brought my whole community here. <laughs> we would have for sure fetch you and all that. But there's opportunities for that, and there's days to come for that. And all I can maybe say at this time is 
uh, continue to do these important meetings, join these coalitions that are talked about, continue to affect the important work you folks are doing at the national level, but perhaps bring us along with you, like today, right? I mean, we're, we're here with you now, and we're happy to participate as much as we can. Um, we've changed these legislations in Oregon and Washington thus far because we've brought the communities that live in the community to uh, the legislature. And it's, it's, yes, it is budget, it is policy, it is all these different priorities, but it is the other important P word, which is people, us. And we matter. And we, as long as we can do it with each other, not for each other, or but with each other truly, um, I believe we can really affect some great changes. Um, and I'm just in awe of all of our speakers today and your work, incredible work, the organizations, and all of you that are here today. I think I'll stop there because of time and see if there's any questions, I'd be love, I'd be love to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, so when uh, we started talking about this event uh, with our colleagues from Plowshares, uh, we didn't really expect um, such a um, large turnout of uh, informed, thoughtful people. We are extremely encouraged, and I'm looking forward to uh, similar uh, gatherings where we can continue this discussion, very important discussion. I was particularly heartened and encouraged uh, when I saw all our colleagues and presenters here. Um, in Amy, uh, even though she didn't make a presentation, you saw the power of someone who can bring her incredible academic knowledge and expertise to issues that are very relevant to us on everyday lives from Iraq to rural Washington and beyond. So I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm going to find a way of um, a comeback to her comment on the Armenians and Turks and that's the next time. <laughs> really appreciate it. Uh, Bruce, of course, shows us um, the importance of professional knowledge, uh, which he uses not only to heal people, but also to heal our communities. That's an incredible commitment um, to his society, and we're all grateful to him for his work. Um, ben shows the importance of public service, um, how important it is, uh, not only to devote yourself, uh, but also to make a difference. and and I must say, to remain so optimistic. That is very, very encouraging for all of us. And Joe, I think, is the most effective uh, spokesperson on these issues. Uh, whenever I hear him, the, the, the power with which he brings his incredible knowledge and expertise into these conversations that are so uh, informative, but also so empowering. So thank you for uh, coming here again, Joe. And. Um, and finally, uh, the, the young people Lily uh, represents here, uh, and this is really, that's what we do uh, every day in the Jackson School at the University of Washington. Uh, we talk with young people, we teach them, and I fully agree with her that this image of young people being uninterested and uncommitted is very far from truth. We see examples of that every day, and when they are given the opportunity and the space, they more than rise to the occasion, and we saw a very good example of that in Lily, and, and I'm really grateful. So I'm grateful to my colleagues uh, who helped uh, this uh, event with this event, and thank you all for coming out here um, as we move towards this uh, holiday season. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm looking forward to welcoming um, all of you again in further conversations, and a very warm uh, thank you to our panelists for their comments. Thank you very much.